Welcome. Welcome to the first ever final presentation session of an Edgy Wiki conference. <laughs> what will happen is we'll have one presentation, I'll do a little bit about outreach and then I've got an exercise for all of you. Um, and then we'll officially close the conference at the, just in time for lunch. Um, and closing with thanks just for lunch, which will be at one as yesterday. Um, Hopefully it will be one this time. So that's the official end of the conference. But we're going to hang around. A lot of us are not leaving until the evening. If you want to stay around and learn more about Wikipedia, learn how to edit, or just talk to us about educational strategy, or get, get to hang around. We've got not this room, but other rooms in this building. We can split up around different small group stuff. You'll just leave after lunch. So lunch is available and free. Please, free knowledge and food. Um, <laughs> stick around and have lunch, and go after. You know, some people have got other conferences to go on to after. Yeah, stick around. And um, I mentioned yesterday that the whole stack of stuff behind Wikimedia is free. So not only is the encyclopedia free content that you can take around, you can adapt, and you can paste it around, you can put that in the book. Uh, but it's guided by policies and guidelines, and those policies and guidelines are developed the same way. They're developed in the development process, you can follow that evolution, and you can take them. I, I take the style guide stuff and feed it and use it in my day job, and I'm pleased to do it. Even the software platform it runs on, MediaWiki, that's free, that's open source, you can take it. You could, uh, Doug Belshaw has it for his thesis site, and um, you can use it for education purposes, commercial purposes, whatever. An example of a successful project in research and education is Wikibet, based on Media Wiki, and we have Chris Trace. Let's talk about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Basil. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start my clock so I hopefully don't run completely over time. Um, first off, I'll, well, I'll do a brief explanation about why um, I'm talking in this session. I feel a bit intimidated because this session is called Next Steps, and I thought that's putting a bit of pressure on us, but that's fine. Um, I was going to talk yesterday with some of the other case examples. Uh, but had a meeting clash and wasn't going to be able to come, and now I could, so now I'm talking today. But it's actually given me the opportunity to listen to a lot of the stuff you guys have said and yeah, take out some bits of my presentation, which are going to be very, very bread and butter for you guys, and try and make it a bit more um, targeted. <coughs> so, yeah, as Martin said, my name's Chris. Um, I'm a vet. I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in London four years ago, and since then have been doing uh, a lot of kind of e learning technology stuff at the college. And two years ago, I became involved in this project called Wikivet, um, and you know, a lot of the name probably gives away quite a lot of what we're going to be doing, I guess. Um, so this is uh, what we see Wikivet as being. This is taken from our introduction page, and the key things I wanted to highlight from here um, is that it's a worldwide collaborative project. We're looking to create the entire undergraduate curriculum, and it's free. Um, and that is very different to any other kind of veterinary educational sites out there. There's not really any veterinary educational sites using Media Wiki as such. There's not really any wikis, full stop. And things that are out there are um, generally paid services. And you know, we're very keen to get um, this educational material out to anybody in the world that wants it. Um, so you know, it's a big thing for us. A few reasons why we started this and why you know, potentially we haven't just done this in Wikipedia. Um, <coughs> there was a few different kind of needs and issues around the time. This started five years ago, um, started in the UK, and at the time there, was, uh, you know, there still is a lot of pressure in universities to try and share some resources because everybody's creating similar stuff and we're all spending lots of money doing this and then nobody's sharing with each other. That was one of the factors. And the vet schools in the UK had had a previous collaboration that was quite successful um, called the Clive Project. And that involved lots of people bringing together different educational resources. Um, some of the issues that are also going on in the background, at the moment, is very easy. If you search Google for a veterinary term, you'll find thousands of hits. The information is not the problem. It's the quality of the information that's the problem. Because anybody whose pet has gone out and their vet's told them they've got this disease, they go out and create a website or create a blog about it. So now there's so much information, it's very difficult for people to sift through um, what's useful. And I definitely found this as a student, you know, you'll, somebody will tell you, generally just after you've done the exam, they'll point you to a brilliant website about something, you're like, if I'd known that a week ago, that would have been fantastic. 
So there's little quality assurance and there's very little signposting to what's good. Um, and also, you know, the age-old problem of as soon as you uh, create a textbook or print anything, then it's outdated. So all of this was um, leading us to think we need to collaborate and possibly the best way to do that would be a media wiki site. Okay? Um, where we've then gone differently from Wikipedia, and these are the key differences, and I think this will hopefully form the basis of this discussion um, and show you then how this has affected our growth and everything. There's a couple of key differences to what we've done and what Wikipedia have done. First off, we restrict our registrations. So Wikipedia, anyone can register, anyone can edit. That was a big problem for our students. They didn't want the, uh, um, they didn't want anybody to be able to come in and then edit content because they wanted to go to that resource and trust that to an essential level. Okay, um, and also you know we had a lot of vets will come in and use this. They want to be able to trust that, and there was a feeling that this wasn't necessarily there in Wikipedia. Um, also, another thing we've done is use a slightly different license. So, you can see the standard um, Wikipedia license wouldn't have a non-commercial. And often, um, with, you know, as we move more towards true open educational resources, often there's a no derivatives clause isn't in there as well. Whereas we've gone for the strictest of the Creative Commons licenses. So we actually do um, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives. And this is because a lot of the content we get is from universities and they want, when they put stuff into this collaborative resource, they want to know that nobody's going to take it somewhere else and then edit it and their name will still be attached to it. And they also really don't want another university or another individual to make money off of their hard work. They're doing this as an altruistic gift to the world um, and they don't want then somebody to go and take advantage of that. So we're trying to keep everything to this license and we restrict our registrations. And you can see then, so we've got um, a few lists here, or standard people that will let in, so vets, vet students, vet nurses, student nurses, and then academics that work at the universities. Okay? Um, and it started, as I said, a few years ago. We got some initial funding from the JISC and the Higher Education Academy. Um, and this was centered around the development of a pathology section. Um, we started off with some academics from a few of their vet schools. So there's now seven UK vet schools. And we started off with the Cambridge, Edinburgh and London vet schools being involved in this project. And started off creating a wiki path section. We've kind of renamed that to pathology because everything was getting wiki something. And, uh, quite a bit much. Um, and this is kind of the breadth of content we're now looking at. So you see we've really gone a bit wider and tried to cover um, the curriculum a lot further. A lot, some of these sections are a lot better built up than others. Um, so I, I generally find our preclinical context, which is uh, anatomy, and physiology, histology, pathology, those are um, a bit more built in. There's got a lot more resources in there. Okay. But we're working on building up the rest. Uh, you, if any of you saw earlier on, we did have a number of articles that's on there. So it's about 5,500 articles at the moment. Um, the total number of pages is something like 30,000. Then we've got a lot of obviously, navigation pages. We use categorization um, a lot to help in navigation purposes. So. Okay. And why did we choose Media Wiki? Well, I've put Wiki, but also Media Wiki. I think there's some slight differences. We obviously wanted to use a Wiki because we can keep content up to date. This is all going to be quite obvious, so I'll rattle through this. Uh, the idea, obviously, is that. In theory, many hands make light work, lots of people can get involved with this, but as Amber and Martin pointed out yesterday, it's very dangerous to just assume, you know, Field of Dream style, if you build it, they will come. It doesn't always happen in a wiki. Um, you know, we find that we build it, lots of people come and look at it, very few people then want to edit anything. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Open source, the fact that this software isn't going to cost us anything, we can edit it, we can adapt it. This part especially, keys into the media wiki part. It was really important for our um, users, vets, students, that they'd understand the technology, that they'd be able to navigate their way around. We didn't want a steep learning curve. We want somebody to land on a page and realize that if they click on a blue word, it'll take them to another page, and realize that you know they can, well, some of them, that they can click here and edit that. Okay? Um, and also, it makes it very easy for us to publish some stuff as educational resources. And I mean, we've done quite a bit of work around trying to structure this content. Um, we found, you know, there were some people touching on it yesterday. I guess 
Wikipedia will work in a certain extent because you've got so many pages that if you type into the search bar, you'll find the thing you want. Um, we don't necessarily have, well, we don't have anywhere near the same number of articles. And for people to find things, they don't always search for the exact same thing you'd think they would. Um, so what we've done is ended up structuring a lot of pages via categories. So these blue lines here are effectively grouping some of our pages into categories. Um, and I'll show you a bit later, but effectively all of our written content we've then sorted via the discipline. So um, for instance, if it's a pathology page or if it's an anatomy page, we'd have it broadly within an anatomy category, then we can subdivide that even further. So uh, for instance, if I wanted to go and look up a page about the heart, I could just type in a search function for the heart, and that would give me pages on heart anatomy, heart pathology, or I could say, oh, I want to explore anatomy today. So I'll go into our anatomy section, I'll then say the cardiovascular system, and I'll be able to go into <coughs> that. But we try and provide lots of routes for people to get to these pages, um, and that, you know, it's something you're all aware of. What we then wanted to do, though, we don't just want this resource to be a, um, a reference resource. It's not just somewhere for people to go and find out what a word means. We're trying to take this beyond an encyclopedia, trying to make this into a learning centre as well. So what we've started doing is integrating a lot of learning resources, which is a very, very broad term, can mean many things. Um, we start seeding this into the website and linking to key pages. So uh, across the top we've got three of our types of self-assessment. Um, a lot of these are built, so the first two flashcards, and, oh sorry, flashcards and wiki quiz, um, they're all built within wiki pages using standard templates that are already out there. Um, so flashcards obviously like simulating a bit of paper where you have one question on one side and the answer on the other. Um, we can do that in a template format. Um, the wiki quiz, similar, you've got some options, you click, it'll give you the answer. All of these resources are built on a specific wiki page, which we then categorised. We make sure that page can be found by all the pages that might want to link to it. And then we make sure that the answers um, from these quizzes will take you back to the content. So we're aware that students may be working through the text content. They may also just decide to have a few hours in the self-assessment section to do some revision. And we want to make it easy to then jump from that back into the content and find the answers. Okay? Um, a dragster one is another one that um, it's like we've created something called uh, well, they're drag and drop activities using a bit of software called Dragster, where you can highlight sections of anatomy and then you have to drag the label in the right place. So we've got a few hundred of these um, spread throughout the site. And then we've also started linking in a lot of multimedia. Um, so we've got quite a few videos from the, the different universities. We've now created our own video site, which I'll show you later. But we create these links to the videos. Um, so if you're on a page and you want to see a dissection of a particular part of an animal, you can click and watch that video. There is something in possible. Um, we've also, in terms of accessibility, where has it gone? Um, we've got a lot of podcasts, thank you. So um, we've got a lot of audio versions of pages. Um, obviously the problem with this then is, as soon as we record it, same as if we publish it, it's out of date, but it is there for that snapshot. Um, we have these then hosted on iTunes U, um, also in our own media site, and we make sure that these are linked prominently on every page, and these get <coughs> used quite well. Um, and we've also, you know, we integrate a lot of learning resources, Loads and loads of stuff. Anything you can, anything we can find and we think that would be useful, we try and link in in the right place. Okay. So what you end up doing then is you've got your skeleton of written content, and what we're trying to do is pad around that all the useful things. So all the flashcards, all the quizzes, all the videos, all the extra bits. Okay. So what we're aiming to do is if a student lands on our page, they'll know this is the best stuff to revise from. Here's the, the current accepted thinking of what this word means, what this topic is, and here's links to good stuff. And we're completely not-for-profit, we have no real agenda here to favour anyone else. So we're very keen, if, you know, if there's a really good website that has some fantastic resources and they're happy for us to link to them, we'll provide links there um, going out to their resource. The way we do this is putting um, a lot of these learning resources into a common template at the bottom of a page. So we'll have our, our page of content, which is very standard to um, a Wikipedia page. And then when you get down to the bottom, you'll have a link and a set of all the useful things you might find useful. 
can see here for this one, this was from the larynx page. You're going to look up the anatomy and physiology of the larynx, which is this part. Then you'll be able to go and look at some drag and drop activities, some flashcards, a video showing a cut through a head, which is lovely, um, a head of a dog, and then a little lecture that you can also go through as well. Note, um, I'll come on to openness and accessibility. Some of these things you might think might be a bit sensitive, and uh, I guess this will, uh, I'll explain later if I don't uh, pick me up on it. Um, so I mentioned that we categorise some of our uh, resources and make sure this is all linked up. Here's an example of how we're using these categories. Um, we had originally used categories massively to organise, say, all of our flashcards here, so we do them by topic, similar to our written content. Um, we'll do them by the topic or the discipline, uh, by species as well, so you could go in and look at all of your GOAT flashcards if you want to, um, and also by the body system, so you could decide on to look at the nervous system and see that it all links up to the correct things. Um, we then have duplicated these systems across our text and across all the resources. So if you actually go up a level, you can look at all resources for the elementary system. So you, if you want to revise the stomach, you can either go to our stomach page, or you go via our system here, and it'll give you every single thing to do with the stomach. Okay? Um, and with this is a similar method then for any internal resources. Our external resources, um, we found because often if you've got this brilliant um, website somewhere, you don't, we don't just want to put a link there going straight to it, <coughs> because we might end up having several links throughout the site <coughs> going to this one external site. And if then anything changes about that, you've got to change several links in several places. Um, and also then there's no real kind of recognition up front. So our way around this is to create a page, a dedicated page within Wikivet for each of our external resources. Um, this is a lovely little resource. Uh, it was an award, award winning resource. If any of you went to Alt C a couple of years ago, I think this won one of the top prizes. Um, and basically you can shine a torch in this dog's eyes, you can poke it in the eye, and you can get it to follow your finger. And um, it's all about kind of uh, problems with the nervous system and the eyes, and you have to try and diagnose if one of his eyes will go the wrong way. Um, but this, we have these pages then about these websites and about these resources. And it means there's this one page that we can then categorise, so we can set this out so it can be found by different ways. We can have lots of pages pointing to this, and then we can give a proper explanation of this resource, we can explain what license is available under, we can say who created it, when it was created, all those, that kind of metadata to do with it. And we thought this is probably quite a nice way of doing it. Um, and then obviously you can just click on the picture or click up there to go out to the resource. Um, this is just a snapshot of our video website, we've also got our podcast hosted in here. And we had originally thought about putting a lot of videos into the site, but realised that at some point you're going to hit limitations on the MediaWiki platform. It's not really designed as a VLE. Um, it does lots of text very well, but it starts struggling when we try and integrate lots of videos. So the way we've done it is create our own video site in a separate system. This is using a platform called MediaCore. So we've set up our own, you've got the URL down there, media.wikivet.net. And we um, have all of our videos linked in here. Uh, people can come in and view them, like them, comment them, um, rate them. And we also have a page, very similar to the resource page before, but have a dedicated page within Wikivet, which then streams that video into. Okay? So it gives us a place we can move that page around, it can have lots of links to it, but then if you want more additional functionality, you can go out here, and comment, and see related videos, and do that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I'll briefly explain a bit about our users, where they've come from, because I haven't really said any numbers yet. Um, we've got, at the moment, about 18,500 um, registered users. So that's all um, you know, people that we've uh, had them email in their credentials, their email address. Um, this shows a few of the vet schools that we've signed up. So when people register, they have to say what vet school they're from, when they graduated, or when they're going to graduate. And we've got currently about 300 vet schools around the world. Um, this is just a fraction of them because it takes quite a while to find where the pin needs to go and put the pin on. Um, the ones with blue pins, those are schools that have been more actively involved. They've kind of created a page about themselves and they've um, you know, done a bit more with us. 
And then all of the ones with these black stars, we have a student, um, a student ambassador, we call them, within those schools. So you can see we've got some student ambassadors. This is Matthias in Chile. Uh, we've got, uh, now I can remember her name, lovely girl in St. Kitts. Uh, we've got a couple of guys, Uganda, so Makiri, and in Nairobi, in Kenya. Um, we've got, you know, Tunisia, Nepal, all over. Um, these students, you know, seeing the value, and their role at the moment is telling other students about this project. Okay. Um, some of our stats for how we've been registering the users, um, you can see it's exponentially going up. Um, we always have a bit more of a surge around October, November kind of time as people are starting the new course, so a bit of a spike there, a bit of a spike there. And effectively, two thirds of our students, are, uh, sorry, two thirds of our registered users are vet students. About just under a third are vets, and then the rest is made up by nurses, student nurses, and others. Um, so yeah, predominantly vet students at the moment. And actually, a lot of those are kind of when they sign up to the schools, which is what we're after as well. Uh, very quick, we did a survey um, showing how people are using this site, and you know we were wanting to know if they are using it similar to Wikipedia, are they going there to find out information about a topic, or are they using it for teaching, or revision, or any other aspects. So you can see, finding specific information is a big chunk, learning is a big chunk, but actually there's quite a lot else, so a lot of people are using this as a revision source, um, very little at the moment of our academics are using it for teaching, but we're trying to increase that. We do have a Spanish site and a French site. These are growing, but slowly. Um, so trying to get those going with partnerships with these schools. And this is a bit I really wanted to jump to, because this is where I really want your help, really. Um, it comes to the many eyes principle. And but I, if I show you our problems, you're, you're bound to um, have some ideas. And I've always seen it as a, a, you know, a big funnel. You've got everybody in the world, your potential market, they need to discover that site. But to actually then um, use the site, we need them to get to the site and then actually want to engage with it. They then need to, we want them to register because that's the step needed for later stages. A lot of them, um, now we've actually opened up a lot of our content, most of our written content is now open. We restrict our learning resources predominantly to encourage them to register. Um, but the difficulty is a lot of people come, they find the information, they leave. Whereas before, to see the information, they had to register. So uh, it's going to be interesting seeing how that's influenced us. Once we've registered, they may go on and edit content. We'd love it if they were then went on and created new content, created pages. Um, the challenge for us, I guess, is trying to work out how to help out these stages. Because where we are now, you know, we're still getting a lot of people registering. The usage, the kind of the site hits are going up also, but there's very, very few people, active users, actually doing the, the content. We went to see the Wikimedia guys in London recently, and they've got 17 million uh, registered users and 100,000 uh, active users. So we at the time had about 17,000. So you think, okay, take three zeros off. So we then look at taking three zeros off on the register, and we're like, well, do we have 100 active users? Um, last week when I looked, we had 10. So it's a much smaller ratio of active users. And I, I've got several theories for that, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, and some of these things here, you know, if we can encourage more people to use the site, hopefully they'll tell people through social media, um, their friends will then discover the site. And also, ultimately, once we get more content in, once we have more pages open, um, once the content is better, it's going to be found by more people, and more people will discover the site. But the problem we've been facing is very much a chicken and egg thing. And people have been mentioning critical mass, all those kind of things, is exactly what we're experiencing. Um, to get more users, generally you need the content to attract them in. But to build the content, you need more users. How do you solve that? Um, for the last uh, I've yeah, only been involved in this for the last two years, but before that, we were very much concentrating on generating content and thinking then that that would make people come. They'll find it, they'll come and look at it. I think that's important because we've now improved our content a lot. Now, we've shifted focus, um, because we're a very small team as you've seen at the moment, we've shifted focus trying to bring more people in and registering. Um, but now it's like, how do you then get those registered users creating the content? And uh, you know, Annie and Cornelia's presentations 
gave us a world of hope looking at these education programs, I have a feeling that's where we need to go and start looking at how we can train up more people to help us with the workload. Um, very briefly, what's worked then? So student ambassadors are helping us. Um, search engine optimization definitely helping us. We've actually got some pages. Um, if you follow that link later, if any of you know the, let me Google, Google that for you. you. Yeah. Um, brilliant little service. When you get people email you stupid questions, you're like, why didn't you Google it? Um, send them a link like this, and uh, it opens up what looks like a Google page, and then like it goes in, and types it in, and then it hits Google search and says, was that so hard? And it takes you to the answers. And actually, if you Google fluid therapy, Wikivet is at the top. We're above Wikipedia's page, which is <laughs> um, so it's, it's working. The system is working, but that's on very few pages. Um, the international spread has worked, but again, it's you know re registering. It's not activity, and we've got our own mobile version. We've got a mobile optimized. We've got an app. Um, stuff that hasn't worked yet is getting key opinion leaders registrations. We'd like to see more. We'd like to see it going faster. And if any of you have tried Google Translate on these sites, it's laughable. Um, we took a page of text, put it into Google Translate, and translated it into Japanese, I think. Then if you then copy that Japanese, paste it into the left-hand side, and translate it back into English, I and mean, that's then translated twice, but it is absolutely unintelligible. And you yeah. see why people that's, true. that's also true of professional translators okay. in Japanese. Yeah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> um, and that's, that's why we went for the language version. So. Um, quick kind of shout out to the team so you see who's involved. A lot of you probably met Nick yesterday, he's the chairman of our steering board. They also have representation from um, some of the vet schools and also Gillian, Hugh, you may know her, from formerly MedEv and now going to HEA, I think. Um, the actual core project team who work on this, it's only three of us. I only spend half my time on this and then my colleagues Gemma and Barra um, spend a bit more of their time on this. Um, yeah, well, it's my cheesy one, you see, like, I can't believe they let me graduate. <laughs> um, and then a few of our student ambassadors, so we've got something like 45 ambassadors at the moment, um, I have to thank them. Um, but yeah, really, I mean, it's many eyes, so let us know what you think. Any Thanks questions? Thanks very much. My question is, um, uh, would it be fair to say that your cat pictures are the most potentially upsetting cat pictures on the internet? <laughs> yeah, there's no cute littens. Uh, uh, what questions do we have? Yeah, I'm just looking, and uh, it's interesting because I was looking at the red blood, the red blood cell pages in Wikipedia, and then comparing it to the red blood cell pages on Wikipedia. Mm. Um, and I, 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 the thing that sort of stood out is the Wikipedia one seems to be a lot more in depth well referenced mm. um, with a lot more technical information in there than actually the one in WikiVet. Was that a deliberate thing to so, sort of... Yeah, so I mean a page like that, that's um, a good example though where there's already uh, a crossover and the, the, one of the big reasons why I was hoping somebody was going to answer this, so um, thank you, uh, or ask this question, but the, one of the big reasons why we felt this wasn't going to work in Wikipedia, a lot of the topics like that, they've been written completely from a human angle. So you'll, is there any mention there of what a, a dog's blood cell looks like, what a horse's blood cell looks like, a bird's blood cell looks like? So birds yeah. have nuclei in their red blood cells. Um, but then if you go onto other disease pages and things, um, so diabetes mellitus, it's all human. Um, okay. And you know that's, that's the thing, uh, we wanted to take this out. And also then if you go on to you know, a lot of our disease things, a disease page in Wikipedia will be written for the owner's perspective, potentially, or you know, for the general public. We're trying to educate undergraduates, so it needs to be a slight step up. And I think this is kind of uh, a bit controversial, but um, talking around about Wikiversity and Wikieducator and Wikipedia, and I do see they do different things. So I think Wikipedia can be, you know, source of knowledge for a lot of things. I don't think it's the sum of all human knowledge because if I go in and start putting in highly detailed information about animal diseases, somebody's going to come in and take it out and say, well, no, that's not right, we'll dumb it down. Um, actually, I think these kind of mini projects and breakouts can be places for higher levels um, of information. So because this is a learning resource as well, is that why you've not put references in as well? So you no, so the reference the thing, yes, I mean, the reference thing is a quality thing. Okay. So we're trying to then go through it and improve the quality. So. Um, we do, I and mean, if you go into other pages in Wikipedia, you'll find a lot of them are referenced. So we do have a range of quality. Um, and I guess that's also a barrier, because if I then started going in, I mean, we've been doing this over year, uh, several years. We kind of um, have different graduates, people around the world creating content. 
A lot of them, if they created a page like that, it would be shot down and somebody would say it's not referenced. Whereas we've posted it because we think it's good information. And now, like at later stages, trying to encourage people to come in and put in the references because we do want it to be fully referenced. Yeah, uh, should we go back there in a bit? Um, yeah, simply, I, I know <coughs> a problem with going your own way is you don't have to sustain things. Mm. As I understand, it means it's at all that much about funding, mm. your project funding, so how is this going to be kept going on for long term? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to date we're not you know, officially associated with Wikimedia. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, my fee here is, I guess, the only support we've had. But that's, you know, we're having, that's fine. We started off with uh, you know, JISC funding, and that was a specific bid. And we've had um, you know, a few JISC funded projects, uh, which have kind of been sources of government funding to allow us to create content. But then currently, a lot of our funding has come from um, Pfizer, a large pharmaceutical company. They've given us um, a certain amount of money each year, which has enabled us to do some of these activities. You don't see any um, Pfizer branding anywhere, you don't see, they have no control over content at all. Uh, but we don't necessarily think that's a sustainable model. So some of the things we're looking at in the future um, could be perhaps looking at making it a freemium site. So we still have the content, the written content free, a lot of the resources free, but then if we can start linking in <coughs> book sales or something through the site, um, if we can create our own um, resources and then charge you know, very small amounts of money for them, then those could be new income streams. We haven't ruled out sponsorship, we haven't ruled out advertising. Um, you know, there does have to be obviously some money coming in because there's some people who work on this and you know, I have a mortgage to pay, so. Um, there, yeah, there is obviously income streams going on. Uh, should we go there, Doug at the back? So, Chris, I, you might have explained that. You skipped over, it seems to be, the bit at the start where you said that it was problematic for opening the site to everybody. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of unpack that a bit more? Yeah, the sure. Because Wikipedia don't seem to have that. Yeah. Non-specialists, therefore, don't have the skills to go to write this up. Yeah, okay. So, the, the big, um, there was a kind of a fear issue. We've identified this with a lot of the stakeholders when we set it up. Um, and this has been backed up by surveys we've done. That students wouldn't trust this site if it was open to everyone and if anybody could come in and edit it. And the kind of information then that you'd have on these topics, it's a reflection of the kind of information that is out there on the web, where people just write lots of stuff about their pet, and you know, people will write something on forums, and anybody will come and look at that. I mean, it's not in Wikipedia, but people look at forums and then say, well, somebody said that, it must be true. Mm. Um, the same could happen potentially in here. I suppose so I'm just trying to think of, um, like, that's a specific example, as someone who was doing perhaps their A-levels. Yeah. Um, and really wanted to go and do web science at, at yeah. uni yeah. Um, and went massively in depth and wanted yeah. to contribute and do all that kind of stuff, yeah. they wouldn't be able to presumably to contribute because yeah. they're not currently a student or a vet. Yeah, so that's, yeah, at the moment that's what we've right. said. Um, just to, for the, because then you do have this range because you could then have an A-level student who says that but then goes off and edits loads of things and, um, you know, we're trying to future-proof this. Um, we've got a team of, well, one person goes through all the recent changes and we don't want to have a million registered users and loads of changes going on. Um, I mean, hopefully then in the future we'd have enough people who were watching pages and have these communities of people actively editing. Um, it hasn't happened at the moment. But also in terms of opening stuff, um, you know, that was in terms of registrations, but we have had a very um, big change in policy. So a year ago, pretty much everything was closed apart from specifically government funded open pages. Um, we decided that actually we think most of our written content should be open. So now a lot of people who wanted to register, like A-level students wanted to go into vet school or pet owners who have just been told that they've got their animals with this disease, they wanted to register to get the information. They now don't need to because they can find that. So we've, we were really worried that that would see a downturn in registration. So we still get more hits because you know, Google's now finding it, people are coming across it, but why would they want to register? So we're trying to balance that and make, make it obvious that you know, there is more stuff if you register. You can get access to um, you know, more support, you can get more um, into some of the resources. And also like then some of the videos and things might not be appropriate for members of the public. There's many examples where you know, veterinary videos and material have been photoshopped and you know, not very nice things done with them. So. 
Any more questions? Should we go at the back? And then, or we've uh, I think we'll two first questions. Yeah. We'll probably do better. Yeah. yeah. Which one? So. Um, I suspect you know the answer to this. I think you can, because it's, your, your site has been built on the stakeholder spheres. And Wikipedia was originally designed based on stakeholder spheres. It was going to be run by experts who were going to run a thing called Newpedia, and that was going to be the world's model. And it was only by accident that the world discovered Wikipedia. And that was a model that built a, a brand new culture which said you don't build something that's wonderful and hope that people will come and use it. You actually go from the people and then build something around them. Mm. And that's the reason why Wikipedia works, is because one of the things, that, <coughs> one nice phrase I like about Wikipedia is, in theory, Wikipedia shouldn't work. Mm. If you actually take the established order of the way things usually develop things, Wikipedia should not exist. I don't think the, one of the problems you've got here is you've got very restricted licensing. I suspect eventually you're going to have to publish it freely. When you do that, you're going to have to throw away the percentage of your content because you've restricted it to people people who have given that to you. It's restricted. You don't know who they are. You can't ask their permission anymore. I do worry about your, your business model. Is there a question in there? <laughs> no, the question was, do, do you not know the answer? Because I think that actually you do know the reason why it would be successful is yes. the fact that it builds around the users yes. and says that's the way you want to work, guys. Jim yeah. Wells may not agree with you. The, yeah. the people who run the organisation, if the organisation said they want to close it down for a day, we close it down for a day. It's yeah. like what all the stakeholders say. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I definitely appreciate that's a concern. Um, and we've tried to build this because it's a di I guess it's because it's a different set of users they have different needs and different wants and but we do I mean we have a problem um, you know lots of we know it's very popular because lots of people use it all the time they come back and can track how long they spend on the site and we know now you know in Kenya this is revolutionizing education in Nairobi in the Uganda vet school they're all using it they've got access to stuff that we've never had before um, so it's being successful so we think it's worth supporting but you do start to get this um, you know, culture, like it was an educational conference and a, a vet um, working at another university said, oh, you know, we'd love to see this in Wikivet. vet. Um, is that going to happen? And I said, well, can you break that down? What do you mean by that? And she said, oh, well, I guess I mean that I'm assuming, can you go and put it in? It's like, well, what's stopping you? you know, like, and I think we have this role of, um, we kind of have to keep up on the education side and I don't know if it's necessarily helping that Big Brother um, Wikipedia there's already lots of content so people are a bit critical when it comes to Wikipedia and if they find there isn't a page they're like oh there's not a page it must be rubbish and they don't, haven't thought well we need to perhaps help in creating that and I think that's part of our education cycle that we need to do yeah should we try that back on yeah. yeah I just I wanted to, to defend the model sort of semi-open because but so often where we're coming from in education is going from closed to shared and then sometimes to open and I think there's still a huge amount of value in going from closed to shared yeah. and um, I also think that because of the business model issue and where things are privately funded or publicly funded everything has to show impact return on investment or whatever things like requiring people register is just going to be the case for a lot of services that is just a fact and so you know the ecosystem of content is going to be made up of these these mixed collections of things and i think also the other thing about <coughs> openly licensed content is i think that there's a bit of um, over evangelism sometimes that it's got to be opener and opener and opener the more it gets used downstream well actually if one piece of open content finds its way to the right user and helps them go, aha, I get it, then it's done its job. Yep. So yeah, open doesn't have to be open, open, open. There are middle ground spaces like this where people are taking advantage of that layer of content and also developing their skills in content and sharing and articulating their own practices. So I just want to defend it. Thank you. Because I think, yeah, then that's, I think, really key because there's no way we would have got the amount of images, the amount of videos, the amount of resources, um, just universities strictly would not do it. 
we're all kind of enlightened people here that are obviously into the open stuff. A lot of these people don't want, they take images, they think all their images and all their lectures are their own property. They don't even realise they're the universities, but they'll hold on to those themselves. And they're very reluctant to share. And you know, the fact that then we've got all of these great resources now out in all these countries that never had this kind of thing before um, is, I think, partly down to that license. And quite honestly, they don't really want to edit this stuff much at all. And they'd rather just have that in its, its format. So it's not a problem for us at the moment. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank Chris again.